Okay, so now we've discussed radar imaging, which is good within the solar system, geometric parallax, which is good up to 100 light years, spectroscopic parallax, which is good up to 10,000 light years, but what if we're interested in an object that's even further away than 10,000 light years? So now we're going to use another technique called Cepheid variable stars. So a Cepheid variable star is an unstable star that periodically gets smaller in diameter and it gets larger in diameter. And so that's going to uh, change the brightness of this object. So in a normal star, normal stars basically have the same diameter and they always have the same brightness because gravity, which is trying to pull it in, is being exactly balanced by the nuclear explosions which are trying to push it out. In a Cepheid variable star, what happens is gravity starts to win and it starts getting smaller. But the smaller it gets, the more pressure is inside the star and the hotter it gets. And the hotter it gets, the more nuclear explosions there are, which is trying to push it back out again. So it will get smaller and it will get hotter and then it will expand and then it will start to cool down a little bit. Then gravity will take over, it will pull it back in again. And so it oscillates in size. And so therefore it oscillates in brightness. So the top picture is a, a, a graph of the luminosity L of one of these Cepheid variable stars and as you can see, sometimes it's dim and sometimes it's bright. Sometimes it's dim, sometimes it's bright. So time is going sideways on that graph. And depending on the size of the star, it has a different period. So some get bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. Others get bright and then dim and then bright and then dim again. So they have different periods and that depends on the uh, size of the star. So it says, it says the longer the period of the star, the more luminous the star is going to be. Larger stars take longer to oscillate because of their inertia. Well, don't worry about that. So all I want you to know is that these Cepheid variables, they exist. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to find Cepheid variables uh, within 10,000 light years of Earth. Okay, and we're going to measure the distance to those Cepheid variables and we're also going to measure their ap uh, apparent brightness using a photometer and then we're going to use the photometry equation to figure out their luminosities. So now we know the luminosities of all the Cepheid variables that are within uh, 10,000 light years of Earth. All right, then we get out our stopwatch and we actually measure the periods for every one of those Cepheid variables. And then we plot it. Okay, so there on that bottom graph is a graph of the luminosity versus the period. And so I'll just write out the word period of those Cepheid variables. And then so we have measured hundreds of them. And so we get this graph. All right, now how do we use the graph to figure out stars that are further away than 10,000 light years? So now we're going to measure the apparent brightness using a photometer of a Cepheid variable star in a, some galaxy cluster. So, I f so it's going to be a Cepheid variable that is further away than 10,000 light years. We're going to measure its apparent brightness using the photometer. We're going to measure its period because we can look at it through our telescope and we can see it getting brighter, dimmer, brighter and dimmer. So we can measure its period. Okay, and now we're going to look it up on this chart. So we find the period on that bottom chart there, we bounce it off the curve, and that gives us L. 
the actual brightness. So if we know the actual brightness, and if we know the apparent brightness with our photometer, then we put it into the photometry equation, and now we can figure out the distance to that star. And if you look, you'll notice that this technique is good out to 10 to the eighth light years. So that's gonna be 100 million light years away. And then we'll be able to measure the distances out to those kinds of objects. So here's an example of how you would use the equation. And so I'll just let you read through it, and, uh, but that's how astronomers do it, how they figure out the distances to these astronomical objects. Okay, so when we come back, we're gonna talk about using the Tully-Fisher relationship in order to measure distances to other objects.